टू वन सर वी आर लाइव नाउ हेलो एवरी वन आई एम डॉक्टर रजत अग्रवाल प्रेजिडेंट ऑफ आसाम इंडिया एंड वेलकम यू ऑल फॉर अवर नेक्स्ट द फ्राइडे शो वॉट वी कॉल इट एवरी फर्स्ट फ्राइडे ऑफ द मंथ वी ट्राई टू होस्ट अ वेबिनार एंड एवरी डिफरेंट टॉपिक दिस डिफरेंट टाइम्स विद एन इंटरनेशनल एंड अ नेशनल स्पीकर सो दिस टूडेज थीम इज द लिम लेंगनिंग एंड वी हैव एक्सलेंट स्पीकर टूडे from dr michael asayag from rubin institute baltimore usa i welcome you sir to spare your time and uh, given your consent to give your talk and our own legend and our stalwart uh, dr mangal parihar he has spared his time to give, uh, he will be talking on the limb lengthening and dr siddharth who will be doing the case discussion so to uh, let's go ahead and mr siddharth Uh, i will hand over to siddharth and he will give a, a brief introduction and then we can start the talk siddharth please well, th thank you rajat sir so clearly our uh, esteemed faculty they need no introduction i don't think i can you know so proceed but joining us from mumbai is very very senior and very experienced the most experienced i would say uh, limb lengthening orthopedic surgeon dr mangal parihar who is now joining us from jaipur in spite of his very busy schedule and joining us live from baltimore is dr michael asiag again very very experienced from the sinai hospital of baltimore the international center for limb lengthening and as dr rajat said today's theme is limb lengthening which attracts a lot of youngsters there are a lot of controversies so we have two very very good talks and to begin with can i invite dr mangal parihar sir to share your screen please uh, thank and you and meanwhile i will like to welcome dr dror pele uh, hello sir welcome and uh, uh, thank you for sparing your, your time to be in the panel and we all are always inspired by you and uh, we welcome you sir to be in this panel and uh, uh, you will be sharing us your experiences and the beautiful insights on the talk i welcome you sir from on behalf of the assam india thank you welcome dr perry thank you for joining hi drawer so first i should i should start off you know you know a little bit of hindi right so i should start off by saying namaste guruji <laughs> you know what what guruji is so he's he's the guru who is who has taught uh, everything that that we know about elizarov he's the one who has inspired us so and i know he has very clear um Uh, thought process in terms of uh, cosmetic limb lengthening so i'll i'll start off with my talk and then we can have um comments and stuff from draw so the the kind of way i have i've focused my talk is should we be doing uh, cosmetic lengthening or maybe it's not that's not the right title it should be probably who should be doing uh, cosmetic lengthening so there's no conflict between the first talk and the second talk my talk is more to warn the younger lesser experienced surgeons from falling into this uh, trap of cosmetic lengthening till they are well experienced and michael is going to give tips and tricks uh, to those of us who are more uh, experienced and he is going to sort of expose one of the facets of uh, elizarov for the younger surgeons <laughs> so in terms of indications the only real indication i think is uh, height dysmorphism now this is a very vague and a gray uh, term but essentially it means people who are not whose internal uh, self image of what their height should be and what their actual height is is not does not match and that causes a uh, quite a bit of emotional turbulence the other commoner causes which people come asking for cosmetic lengthening is i am too short for the army too i want to get into films i want to get into modeling if i was taller i would be better uh, marriage girl you know people from the west want uh, they think that if they get taller they will get more uh, girlfriends and stuff like that all of these that second bunch is complete uh, bs these are patients who will not really benefit uh, from limb lengthening yes 
somebody who's very experienced in particular very particular individuals uh, may do it but in general i would say that is not something that uh, <clears throat> the person who's starting out should get into at all so these guys are uh, they have more reasonable uh, height requirements they don't come with demands of you know 10 cm and 16 cm they are they 6 to 7 cm is something that can be safely done without uh, too many complications the moment you hit 6 and 7 cm the number of complications starts uh, increasing they they tend to be more motivated for working hard on all, all the rehab they follow all the instructions uh, that we give them and in, this is the one group i think where attaining length is not a cosmetic thing but it is a therapeutic thing for their um, emotional issues now what does a cosmetic limb lengthening uh, entail of course all of us know that lengthening uh, takes time for the regenerate etc to uh, to to uh, heal properly and and solidify and at a minimum i would say it is one and a half month per centimeter the generally touted uh, figure is one month per centimeter but i don't think that's really true uh, it's even more than 1.5 it tends to be closer to two months uh, per centimeter so even if you say one and a half month per centimeter that's about nine months for a six centimeter lengthening to heal more than six or seven you get uh, many more uh, complications and all said and done it takes them 10 to 12 months for uh, attaining a normal gait now, one thing which many people don't realize, and uh, unfortunately, many uh, surgeons don't explain to them, is that uh, especially if they want to keep the lengthening hidden, which is most of them, they are away from friends and society while um, the frame is on. And if the family doesn't know of this, uh, that's a surefire recipe for problems in India, at least. Uh, maybe in the West, with people becoming independent earlier, it's a different issue but in india you remember the case in hyderabad uh, where the uh, parents didn't know where the son was they complained to the police and that led to a big uh, problem for the surgeon himself now unless they are working in something like it where they can continue working from home uh, getting to work also becomes uh, a problem in a place like uh, india where public transport is not good uh, transport for people who are uh, challenged in any way is also not good and the most important thing we have to think about is the concept that even though short uh, the person is completely normal in terms of range of motion in terms of all the um, activities that he's able to he or she is able to do and even if you give a even if that patient gets five degrees less dorsiflexion at the end of that lengthening he is, he is going to become a tall abnormal or I would say even a less short abnormal. And that is not a, a, a good deal in, in the long run. Which bone do we do lengthening? The tibia is easier, but the tibia has uh, trouble in terms of the gastroc and the tight uh, and the large muscle mass behind, which can lead to an equinus, a flexion deformity of the knee. Uh, the femur has more soft tissue uh, so healing may be better but there are issues with the knee range of motion a flexion deformity uh, of the hip and pin sides LON that is lengthening over nail in the tibia i think is is doable femur personally i would not uh, do a femur uh, lengthening over a nail it's it's too um, troublesome a procedure for a cosmetic lengthening when there are other problems also uh, it entails when you're doing a cosmetic lengthening you can develop uh, bony deformities if you are not careful about uh, how you put your frame on the stability of the femur etc in case of the femur and the tibia but generally it is done in the femur now we have this uh, precise nail which used to be available in, in india since the last i think uh, four five or six months it, it is not available because of some change in the company and we don't know what uh, you know when that will be available again you have to consider the cost of uh, surgery and importantly the cost of uh, physiotherapy so this is a procedure which cannot uh, be charged in the same way as you would charge for a tibial uh, 
non-union or arterial transport, for example. There's, there's much more uh, stuff involved in doing the surgery as well as uh, post-operative care. Many of us may not have access, if you, if you, you know, um, those of you who know about what happens in, in uh, Baltimore, in Florida with Dr. Paley's current uh, center, there is a full physiotherapy department uh, which works on these patients on a very regular basis. And not many of us have access to that kind of physiotherapy. So you have to ensure that the patient is going to have uh, therapy. <laughs> These patients themselves, for want of a better word, I would say, are demanding uh, personalities. Many of them don't realize what all of this entails. It, they think it's it's just uh, something as good as a nose job or a boob job. You get your surgery done, get it, lend them. So I would say about 80% of my uh, patients, when I tell them all the negatives, they don't come back, which is a good thing. Some people who are who are pushing cosmetic uh, lengthening as a, a you know factory procedure, uh, they are given wrong time frames by doctors in their various fora that they discuss things in, and they are full of misinformation uh, from the net in terms of they will know more about things like proportions, diets, alternative medicine, the use of pot than you have ever um, learned, and there many a time there expectations uh, tend to be unreasonable. Uh, again, to underline, guys who or people who are uh, with this height dysmorphism kind of issue, many of them are motivated. They have very clear um, uh, expectations. But I'm talking of the average Joe who, who comes for a cosmetic uh, lengthening. Now, it involves also the surgeon. What is the surgeon's um, training? And as uh, Dr. Paley always says that uh, cosmetic lengthening is the apex of reconstructive surgery. When you build your base with doing enough tibial non-unions and deformities, femur non-unions and deformities, uh, unilateral post-traumatic lengthenings, then you are uh, enabled, I would say, to do stuff like unilateral congenital lengthening because these are the ones which give you the most uh, trouble and or cosmetic. You could, you could you know, move these uh, two indications up or down. And in that situation, uh, you can do a, a lengthening over nail of the tibia uh, or a lengthening over nail or lengthening and then nailing of the uh, femur. Personally, I'm not much in favor of, of doing this uh, for the femur. And for, for the average orthopedic surgeon or even the person who's doing uh, Elizabeth, um, he, he would think that, oh, what's, what's there to do in a nailing, especially when it comes to this precise, which is an implantable nail. I've done enough nailing. And there, I would say the difference is between a carpenter and a gardener. You, getting that regenerate to uh, heal and not having trouble with the regenerate is something that is uh, learned over a long time, how to prevent and avoid uh, problems <laughs> and you have all kinds of uh, troubles from these lengthenings just like Elizabeth, but it tends to be a little amplified um, with these patients and all of this leads to a loss of sleep for the surgeon so we've done 10 patients um, with the precise nail uh, that is cosmetic limb lengthenings we've done six with the precise for um, length discrepancies, one in the femur, 16 with um, LON on the tibia. And then I've treated 10 complications uh, which have been done by uh, other surgeons, some of whom uh, <clears throat> Dr. Paley has made famous, I think. So then why am I advising you against doing a cosmetic lengthening? Do I want to you know, really try to corner the whole cosmetic limb lengthening market over here? No. I want to. I want you to avoid having trouble. So only after having a good experience with the Elizabeth for regular um, usage, where you are able to apply the frame without too many uh, complications, you are able to deal with the difficult outcomes or the poor outcomes of your own cases in terms of trauma. All of this allows you to avoid and recognize problems which are evolving in these uh, difficult patients you need to have a good physio as part of your uh, team. And as I told you earlier, um, uh, Dr. Paley and uh, Baltimore, they have entire departments which are, which are devoted uh, to this. So the very least I think you need is 
a good uh, physiotherapist. And you need the ability to identify the problem patients uh, before surgery. Now, some of this is a seat of the pants uh, flying. I don't think there's any real psychological test, etc., which can rule out uh, trouble. So I usually try to find out what does the patient expect uh, from the lengthening. I, for one, am all uh, absolutely, uh, I demand that a family or a loved one should be a part of the consultation so that uh, everyone hears what the complications, possible complications are. And I explain uh, all of the negatives more than uh, whatever are the uh, positives, right? And um, therefore, if I, if I have to do a cosmetic lengthening and the patient can afford it, the best is uh, something like the precise nail because that is the most convenient um, for the patient. The next best, I would say, is to do a lengthening uh, over nail. I would only do that in the tibia. That gives us reduced fixator time, less chances of uh, deformity due to an unstable fixator. But because you're putting the nail in and you may not be able to put in all the uh, wires and pins that you would normally, stability can be uh, an issue. At the end of the lengthening, because you put the uh, nail only till where you are allowed by the distal ring. And then as you distract, the nail retracts in the distal fragment. So essentially at the end of the lengthening, you get a smaller length of nail in the distal uh, fragment. And we tend to use a thinner nail uh, compared to trauma nails uh, in, in uh, lengthening over a nail so that we can we don't have any jamming of the nail. Lengthening and then nailing, the stability issues are uh, improved, but I think there are contrary, uh, there are other troubles in terms of maintaining the uh, length, the, the sterility and things like that. So this one could argue between a LON and a LA uh, TN. So <laughs> I will leave you with a couple of uh, patients. Um, <clears throat> one with somebody which someone else has done, one which uh, I have done, where there have been significant, significant uh, problems. So there was this 16-year-old six, girl who was brought by the father who came to inquire about uh, stature lengthening. And during the consultation, the sense I got is that, uh, you know, the child is less, uh, should I say, wanting the lengthening compared to the father. So they'd, they'd come from somewhere in the uh, Middle East and uh, she was otherwise normal. And dad had come with the idea that, okay, now uh, we've come from um, ex, you know, such and such place and we've come ready for um, the lengthening and I want you to do the lengthening uh, tomorrow. I remember this very clearly. This was one of the last consults on a busy day in the in the evening. And then I spent another 45 minutes to an hour uh, with him, uh, trying to couch it in polite terms that she's at a you know age where she's not fully mature enough. Because girls, I think, by this age are capable. And I got the sense that she's being pushed uh, for the surgery. So I said, let her finish her studies now. Then once the exams are over, you all both of you all come over. And we shall arrange for counseling and then uh, take it forward. And what I really meant by that was counseling uh, both for the child as well as uh, mom and dad to find out, you know, where these problems are and try and explain to them that this is not necessarily the right case. Now, uh, they when, when they were with me, they said, yes, yes, yes. And then they went to uh, another eminent surgeon. Uh, who my who probably thought that oh it's you know I can do a nail, and um, he did all of this. <clears throat> they had some uh, splints. She has been following up. So this was July, uh, two thousand nineteen, and she came to me in October um, twenty. She had significant uh, deformities. She had been given Botox followed by a cast and stuff. So she had a flexion deformity in both knees. Um, of about 20 degrees, equinus of about 30 degrees, no further passive stretching. She had very poor quadriceps. That means she had not been doing her um, exercise as well. She was walking with a crouched gait. Scars were all uh, fine. And she had a lengthening <clears throat> with the precise in the tibia. 
an attempt had been made to stretch it out uh, forcibly. So they caused hypertrophic, uh, heterotropic ossification in the knee. They avulsed the insertion of the um, tuberosity of the calcaneum. And the, the, the regenerate was, was healing, but she was walking uh, terribly, significant dystrophic appearance. So I said, you know, right now you stop all this passive therapy, she has to undergo aggressive, uh, active range of motion, and then we'll see what to do for the um, knee and the ankle. So at two years post-surgery, um, after she'd been doing and her muscle strength and all has improved, um, this was her position where she had a manipulation under anesthesia to see whether any, not really a manipulation, a plaster under anesthesia to see whether anesthesia relaxes any spasm, etc. Her equinus and flexion deformity persists. She is a um, ambulant, but she is dependent, and that is her um, X-ray. So the bone is healed, but this whole um, issue of the knee contracture, the ankle equinus, etc., still needs to be solved. So um, she is at the moment, you know, suffering all the troubles that she she has because of a lengthening which probably according to me should not have been done so here uh, you have to learn to say no to patients um, lengthening as we already know actually is not only of the uh, bone uh, patient should have very regular therapy and uh, stop when Lengthening is not keeping up. I mean, the, the therapy is not keeping up with the lengthening, then you stop the lengthening. Uh, and this is something I warn patients um, about that if I find that you are developing contractures, which is not resolving with a therapy, the lengthening stops there, following the same principle that a short normal is better than a long um, abnormal, right? So I think this, this is a, a case to underline uh, all the troubles that can happen because this was done by a surgeon who is not someone who is uh, starting off this was done by a surgeon who was who was well um, experienced with other kinds of um, surgeries but not necessarily with uh, limb lengthening so with that uh, i will end here and open up for questions thank you Thank, thank you, you, sir. Dr. Mangal, sir. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the excellent insight about the real world of the cosmetic limb lengthening. And uh, before asking the questions, uh, I will invite uh, Dr. Pelly to uh, tell his experiences and his recommendations on cosmetic lengthening. Uh, sir, what's your uh, uh, recommendation? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and it's a pleasure always to come back and speak to uh, Indian orthopedic uh, uh, surgeons. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very important subject right now. I've been doing cosmetic lengthening for 36 years. Uh, my first case was uh, uh, 19, of cosmetic was 1988. My first case of for uh, achondroplasia was 1987. So for stature lengthening, whether it's for dysplasias or for cosmetic, I've been doing it a long time. And I've done hundreds, if not already thousands of cases in that time. We currently do more than 100 cases of cosmetic lengthenings a year. Um, and that number has obviously grown. But I've learned a lot in this field, um, and I'd like to share with you some of those lessons. You know, the first 22 years I did this, and I was in Baltimore at that time, I used to be the director at the Rubin Institute, and I moved from there to Florida 14 years ago. Um, but during that time, I worked, um, I was the only surgeon almost in the United States doing cosmetic lengthening. And I worked with a psychologist. We had every single patient evaluated. And um, we learned that basically the motivation for the majority of people who want to do this is um, the, 
they're driven by being bothered by their height. They're unhappy with their height. We therefore gave this condition a name, height dysphoria. I don't think you should use the name that you used, uh, uh, height dysmorphism, because in fact, this is not a dysmorphism. They're normally morphic. They're normally, uh, these are, these are, are um, uh, people without disproportion, without any dysmorphism as opposed to our dysplastic group, which truly have dysmorphism. So these people are psychologically bothered by their height. It starts in adolescence usually, um, they feel juvenileization because they're treated uh, younger than they really are due to their height. They're bothered by it for a long time. There are many, many causes. There's many books written about this, articles written about this, huge amount of literature about the effect of height on economics, on jobs, on, on uh, partnering, on, and so on and so on. I won't get into that. But what we studied when we looked at this, we found that every one of these had a similar personality type, that they were really bothered by their height. And you could give them psychologic therapy as much as you wanted. It didn't change anything. They continued to be bothered by their height. The only thing that changed anything is actually doing surgery in an attempt to increase their height. And what we found is that the amount we lengthened was not related to the satisfaction or to the result. The amount we lengthened, um, in fact, Several patients stopped shorter their goal. What it did is it turned off a switch. There's like some switch that's on that as long as they can't do anything about their height, it's on. The moment you do something, you turn that switch off. And these people who are truly miserable because of their height, um, you know, suddenly they're happy. Um, I could tell you numerous stories about patients who underwent this and it totally changed their confidence, their outlook on life, many, many things uh, because they had this surgery done. Now, part of it is predicated on achieving the goals of the lengthening. And the problem is that lengthening, it, you don't always achieve your goals and you create a lot of complications as Mungle mentioned and there are risks of that. And so there's a few things that we have to consider as orthopedic surgeons. Uh, and by the way, in my early days, I used to have a psychologist evaluate them. I don't do that anymore. I'm able to evaluate them myself, but I'm also convinced now that <clears throat> we're doing the right thing for most of these patients. Now I've treated hundreds of them, okay? It's different than somebody doing their first one. They've gone to a limb lengthening course and they know how to put an external fixator or a nail inside and, and, and lengthen. Uh, as, as was pointed out, that is fraught with complications and disasters. And really we need to avoid that. For the first 22 years of doing this, I was a salaried physician. And even though these patients are paying cash, this is not covered by insurance, I'd never profited from 22 years of treating these patients. I am now in private practice and I do profit from treating patients who are cosmetic uh, because I'm in private practice, but it was never my motivation. Why am I mentioning this? Because it is the motivation for 99% of surgeons who are doing this. The reason surgeons wanna do cosmetic lengthening is mercenary. I'm being completely honest. There is no other reason that any surgeon wants to do cosmetic limb lengthening. They're doing it for money. I did it originally not for money for 22 years because I felt that somebody needed to figure out how to do it safely, reliably, and reproducibly. I am in private practice, so I do profit now from doing this type of surgery. The problem is that when it becomes profitable to people to do this, and especially in the United States, I can tell you our reimbursement is being limited by government, by various insurance companies and so on. There is this strong motivation to do it for money. 
And that tampers with judgment. And therefore, these patients become preyed upon by doctors from all over the world because this is a cash business. And so this has become a real problem worldwide. I can tell you that in India, you have one center, I won't mention the doctor's name so I don't get sued, but you have one center in New Delhi by a surgeon there who you need to stop because he is hurting people. I see so many of his complications and he is simply doing this for profit with no care or consideration for patients and he's hurting patients. We had a surgeon like that in the United States. His name was George Vito. I do mention his name because he has been sued and he has actually lost his license to practice. And he was doing terrible things in the 1990s and early 2000s to patients and causing one complication after another, malunions, non-unions, perineal nerve palsies, contractures, arthritis, and so on. I even, one of the patients he treated committed suicide because he was so upset by his final result. I operated on eight of his patients to fix the problems. The surgeon in India, I've now operated on about seven or eight of his patients. I will not mention his name. But the point is that this has to be done responsibly. Yes, it is lucrative. Yes, surgeons make money because it is cash pay. And the, this is a huge problem. So cosmetic lengthening, there is like any other cosmetic surgery in that it is a body image disorder. That's what's wrong with these patients. They have a body image. They're not doing it to be a better basketball player. And they're usually not doing it to be, you know, uh, to be a, a model or this or that. They're doing it because they have a body image outlook that is distorted. And this fixes that. It really does. We've proven that in psychologic testing. We've published that. But we can really cripple these people and not return them to previous level of function. We've looked at our patients and we get our patients back to previous level of function. That's a very tall order. Remember these patients are starting 100% functional. You can't make them more functional. Orthopedic surgeons are used to treating pain and disability. That's what we're experts at. We've never been trained to be cosmetic surgeons. Now, everybody wants a piece of that lucrative cosmetic market, which is what's driving surgeons to do this. There's not a single surgeon out there anymore who's doing this because they really want to improve patients' body image disorder. They want to improve it for money. And that's the only reason. And it's okay to do that. Plastic surgeons do this all the time. They improve other people's body image problems for money, but they do it responsibly, hopefully. We need to do it responsibly. And to do so, just knowing how to put a nail in or a fix it on is not enough. You have to have the infrastructure to support this. We have irresponsible surgeons in the United States right now who see the patient put the nails in, give them instructions, send them home, tell them they should do stem therapy, and there's no follow-up. And it's complete, and, and these patients are getting into lots of trouble. So I fix problems from almost every limb, cosmetic limb lengthening surgeon in the United States, not all, but a lot of them, because the majority are not experienced surgeons. I don't fix Dr. Asayag's problems. He's <laughs> doing a good job, okay? But my point is, and I'm sure, I'm sure Michael sees patients like this too, who come from other centers and they're not given a therapy program. They're told to go lengthen. They're barely given x-rays on a routine basis. 
And, but I'm sure they collect the fees from these patients. So this has to be done responsibly. I have published a paper on this, of how to do this, how to do it correctly, and, and the, you know all the various steps. And I think unless you can provide that support to the patient, including rehab, including every two week follow-up, including a knowledge of how to treat complications. You should never do a surgery that you don't know how to manage the complications. So here's a question that anybody who wants to do cosmetic limb lengthening needs to ask themselves. Do you know how to treat the complications of limb lengthening? Do you know how to treat knee contractures? Do you know how to treat ankle contractures? Do you know how to treat poor regenerate? Do you know how to treat premature consolidation? Do you know how to treat nerve entrapment that occurs during lengthening, like a, per, a drop foot, perineal nerve palsy, that kind of thing. Do you not? So if, let, let me put it in terms that every orthopedic surgeon understands. If you do joint replacement of the hip, let's take the most common ubiquitous, you know, procedure done. Is there any joint replacement surgeon who does joint replacement surgery without knowing how to treat a dislocated hip replacement? Of course not. Is there anyone who does knee arthroscopy that doesn't know how to treat septic arthritis of the knee after knee arthroscopy? Of course not. And, and so on and so on. So the majority of people who do cosmetic limb lengthening have no idea how to treat the stiff knee that occurs, the quinous ankle that occurs, the poor regenerate that occurs, um, the chronic pain that occurs, the nerve entrapment that occurs. You know what that means? They should not be allowed to do limb lengthening. You got to know all of that. And the true sign that someone is prepared, adequately prepared to do cosmetic limb lengthening is that they have cut their teeth on limb lengthening for limb length discrepancy. They have experience treating either congenital developmental or post-traumatic limb length discrepancy with the same implants that they're planning to do for cosmetic. So the discussion today should not be on what's the best device to use for cosmetic limb lengthening. Is it the fixator? Is it this? Is it that? Well, we have cost considerations. We can't afford an implantable nail. They don't sell it in India. On it. We can get into all that. The discussion is so much more basic is who should be doing this. Mungle hit the nail on the head. So to start with, it should only be experts in limb lengthening, not experts in collecting money from patients who can afford to pay. I think everyone's an expert in that, okay? So this is a very serious thing. We are crippling people. I'm not, I'm sure Michael's not, I'm sure Mungle's not, okay? But as an example, you have a surgeon that you should discipline and somehow he should lose his license to practice in New Delhi. And, you know, I'm happy to provide that name privately, but not on a public forum like this. But that surgeon is out of control and he makes all of your country surgeons look bad. And there's only one reason he's doing this. Funny. There's a group in Turkey does the same thing. I see one patient after another of theirs with complications. I see them from all kinds of centers, whether they're American or around the world. They're all undercutting each other on cost because that's the, that is a, a limiting factor for most patients is that this costs a lot. Let's take in the United States, the cost of this in the United States, okay? from different surgeons, if you include all medical costs, ranges from 80 to $100,000, okay? The implants themselves, we're all using the precise nails. So the implants themselves are at least 15,000 in nails. So, I mean, $30,000 of that is just implant costs. I, I know that's really unaffordable for most Indians, okay? Um, but in that, is a good chunk for the surgeon and a good chunk for the hospital. So there's a lot of a lot of motivation to do this. But the cost of this is chronic pain, disability, 
and reduce function. And so we really have to think about who should be doing this. How do you regulate this? There is no way in the United States to do this right now. Okay. Um, you guys should think about this for India. And if your group is responsible, then they'll come up with guidelines for that. In the United States, this has been controversial for a very long time. It's become less and less controversial and has become accepted. And you see articles in the newspaper and on TV all the time about this. Um, but it's driven by, by, so by economics. It's not driven by, it's driven by patient demand and by economics. It has become easier with the implantable nails, probably fewer complications, but the, the principles are the same. The ethics and morals of this are the same. The responsibility remains the same. So I'll kind of end that. I'm happy to come back to that. I haven't talked about what's the best way of doing this. What do you need to know? You know, things like, do you do iliotibial band release proximally or distally? Uh, do you do that in every femoral lengthening? Is there a role for tendochiles lengthening or gastrosoleus recession, or should you avoid that completely? You know, um, you know what about um, fixators lengthening over nail uh, versus nails if we can't afford the implantable nails? These are all good questions, but um, you know, I don't, I don't think time allows me to kind of expound on all those areas. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, for, for all these queries, which we will be having, we will be needing your lecture in the coming months, a detailed lecture or on the management of the complications. And so thank you, sir, for the real insight, what's going on around the world. And now I invite Dr. Michael for his talk on the limb lengthening. Dr. Michael, please. All right, thank you so much for the invitation. And it's an honor to participate to this panel and to uh, be talking after Dr. Paley, who uh, just like Dr. Parihar, really hit the nail on the head. And uh, I'm lucky enough to be working in a center that was pioneered, obviously by, by Dr. Paley himself and, and Dr. Hertzenberg, but I got to learn from their wisdom. Um, actually, as a disclaimer, I am now the salaried um, sturgeon who does it because I was tired of seeing the complications from these centers who do not seem to learn from their complications because patient after patient comes in with the same complication and oftentimes complications that are extremely preventable with just a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of insight. So without further ado, um, Staying out of trouble in height enhancement surgery, stature lengthening surgery, call it what you will, it's cosmetic height surgery. Full disclosures, I am not being paid for anything. And um, this is me in Pune in 2019 wearing the Pune hat, the teaching Pune hat, and me with Dr. Shamsul. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. There used to be a time where limb lengthening was only something of uh, cosmetic limb lengthening of science fiction. And historically, it was done with cumbersome external fixators. And, you know, sometimes it still is with various methods. However, as the technology improved and with the, the, um, the coming of internal lengthening devices, comfort has greatly improved. And it has really increased the desire it has increased the market into this, this field. Basically more and more people realize that it's, it's accessible, it is not scary anymore, and um, they wanna pursue the, the, the quest for being taller. Why do they do that? Well, Dr. Pelly coined the term, he talked about it earlier, of height dysphoria or height neurosis. And basically it's, it's a 
perception, a distorted perception of self body image that creates a lot of anxiety for multiple reasons, both personal and social, um, due to unhappiness about their height. What's extremely interesting is that it, it is irrespective of the height. We see people who are um, 150 centimeters that have height dysphoria, but we also see people who are 182 mil, uh, centimeters uh, with height dysphoria. And it really comes from that self body image that is distorted. But there's a, a very vast body of research about it. We, uh, we know, quote unquote, that tall people are more successful. Uh, even in academia, uh, we know that chairmen in the US are on average 2.14 inches taller than professors who in turn are taller than associate professors and assistant professors, right? And the assistant professors themselves are 1.25 uh, inches taller than the average population of their age. There's, there's a vast body of, of literature also on the topic. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, Blink, uh, studied a population of CEOs. And basically, he, he saw that you know, about 15% of the population are six feet or over. Um, in metric, it's 185 centimeters. Among, however, amongst the uh, Fortune 500 companies, that number is close to 60%, which is completely disproportional to the rest of the population. 3.9% of adult ma male are six two or taller, but is in his sample of CEO, it was 30%. There is a concept of height premium. All people make more money. And some studies have showed that height is positively associated with um, an increase in income, but quote unquote, an increased uh, in cognitive abilities. This is a very common uh, complaint. Short people cannot get dates, right? It's extremely difficult for short men to, uh, to find a suitable mate. And that has um, seen spawning a lot of online communities, the Lim Lang Thing forums, YouTube channels, Discord channels of men and some women who gather and, and complain about their height and try to find solutions. They, they advise each other. However, these communities are also a, um, a nest of misinformation and some good information hidden in between. So in 2020, uh, my old mentor, Dr. Robert Rosbrook and myself have published um, in um, JLLR about the psychological and orthopedic outcome of stature lengthening surgery using IM nails. And what we found is that it is safe, right? 100% uh, of patients regain excellent SME pain and functional scores. And with an average of 6.4 centimeters of new height, there were clinically and statistically significant improvement in self body image in everyday activities. And that was done using validated, um, validated um, scores from the body image literature. And we know from multi multiple studies and, and meta-analyses uh, and systematic reviews, pardon me, that cosmetic stature lengthening is safe and has a low rate of severe complications when done in the right hands. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But really, we live in a world of cosmetic procedures. It's, be, it's become completely accepted in most fields of surgery. Plastic surgeons do it all the time. Um, OMFS, ENTs, oculoplastics, dermatologists, practitioners. Uh, social media is full of people showing off their breast augmentations, their butt lifts, their new shin, their injectables. And it's time we start talking about cosmetic orthopedic surgery. Historically, orthopedic surgeons, and still now, are shunning cosmetic procedures. We are functional surgeons. We want to address problems, and we would never dare operate on someone who has no functional issue. But the truth of the matter is, the population demands it. There is a demand, growing demand, for height lengthening surgery. But there's also a growing demand for knock knee corrections, boat leg corrections, rotational corrections, which creates a lot of mental anguish for some patients, for some people. So who gets 
cosmetic lengthening? Well, it's a majority of male. Some females, they're highly organized. They're, they've done their research extensively. Most of them have met all the surgeons and, and know the pedigree of all the surgeons on the market. They're high demand, they're high anxiety. It's not dissociable from their, uh, from their problem, which is high dysphoria. And I spent on average three to four hours with each, with each patient in active discussion before the schedule and a couple more hours before they, they get to the operating room. So they're extremely high demand. And I'll go as far as saying that there's easier ways to make money. My joint replacement uh, partners make a lot more money than I do uh, doing cosmetic height lengthening and limb lengthening surgery. Minu Patel uh, has published an editorial in uh, uh, JLLR in 2017 saying, you know, limb, cosmetic limb lengthening is the elephant in the room and it's, it, it's going nowhere, right? It's here to stay. So rather than prohibit it and rather than taking a hard stance against it, well, we should mitigate the harm. We should decrease the harm done to these patients who go to, you know, the, the lowest better and provides with subpar standards, subpar surgery, and end up with crippling com complications. And he came up with these guidelines to which I abide, I believe, fully. This surgery should be done by experienced fellowship trained limb lengthening surgeons. It should be done in major hospitals with backup facilities. One should have access to ICU. One should be able to either start or have access to ECMO. Um, there should be no coercion. There should be no um, non-refundable uh, financial um, deposit done. And as Dr. Pili mentioned, there should be national bodies that have the duty to report and reprimand un underperforming and exploitative colleagues and those that indulge in unethical practice. So with that being said, how do we stay out of trouble in height lengthening surgery? Well, I break it down in uh, at least three phases, right? The preoperative phase, the intraoperative phase, and the postoperative phase. And I'll go back to that slide because it's so important. Preoperatively, you want to abide by ethical conduct, right? First, do no harm. And the only way to do no harm in doing cosmetic height surgery is to know what one is doing. Cosmetic height surgery is a, and limb lengthening in general is a world of obstacles. It's a world of problem. It's a world of complications. And the only way to avoid all those problems and complications is to know about them, to know how to prevent them. And really, experience and training is key. Second thing is there should be some form of psychological evaluation, whether it's done by a trained uh, psychologist or therapist or by the surgeon themselves with enough experience in the field to recognize problematic behaviors. So where my opinion differs than, than Dr. Pilly's is that we do have a bias as surgeons because the, the people who end up in our office to undergo this procedure have failed everything else. They have failed the conservative treatment. I routinely meet highly successful people. Uh, not so long ago, I met the CMO, chief medical officer of a, of a hospital nearby. Uh, not too tall, five foot six or so, highly successful. And he told me, you know what? I used to consider that, but then, you know, I have a beautiful wife. I'm, uh, I'm chief medical officer. I'm 38 years old. I have enough money and I don't think about my height anymore. The guy is jacked, hits the gym nonstop because he found other ways to get that self body image. Well, us as surgeons, we don't see these patients because they usually don't end up in our office. Uh, but for some people, it may be beneficial. I think it's important as well to recognize the true body dysmorphic disorders. So the, the, the people who, no matter how tall they're going to be, no matter how beautiful they're going to be, uh, are still going to be unhappy about their appearance. The obsessive compulsive disorders who will uh, buck on x-ray details, millimeters, half degrees, 
those who won't understand the, the difference between X-ray findings and clinical significance. And then severe mood disorders and self-harm ideations as well should be, uh, should be uh, avoided. So this is the example of a, uh, of a 27-year-old male came into my office uh, with a respectable height of, of 176 centimeters, which is five foot 10. He's always had the dream of, um, of being at least six foot tall. He stated that his reasons were because he, um, he was already surrounded by taller people. And despite the fact that he was already tall, his whole family was taller than him and also wanted to be a fashion model. Um, it was, sorry, he was a fashion model, but wanted to reach higher end brands that told him that he was too short. So he was very convincing. I uh, booked him for surgery and four months later, he reached uh, a whole eight centimeters and was extremely happy. Uh, you can see his post uh, lengthening height at 185 uh, centimeters, extremely happy. Until a week later, a week later, we calls and he really would like to shorten three millimeters because he doesn't like his proportions and seven is his lucky number. So he'd like to reach 77. And a week later, he wants to shorten another full, full centimeters. And he comes back three weeks later and he shortened down to five centimeters. And at that point, he can't stand without falling. His quadriceps are overstretched. He became super weak and he was provided with braces and told to stop shortening. Come back, comes back a week later and he shortened down to three centimeters. We take his ERC back. And then I get a phone call from Nuvasive telling me that the patient is reaching out and he's asking for an ERC. By that time, he's wheelchair bound. He cannot ambulate, he cannot extend, despite uh, many hours of counseling and, and discussion and, and a recommendation to see a psychiatrist, he, uh, he disappears. And um, I've never heard from him again. That was a few, uh, a couple of years back. So that's an example of how identifying a, a patient where, or, or lack thereof, missing a patient that has much deeper psychological problem than just a, a body height issue uh, can really cause, cause problems. Number two, set realistic expectations. A patient who walks into your office and asks for 25 centimeters of height uh, is not reasonable, okay? And, and this is, a situation where you want to set the record straight. A realistic expectation is five to eight centimeters in a single lengthening, 10 to 12, maybe in two processes, in two lengthenings, maybe up to 13. But more than that, we'll start having an impact on function. Earlier, I, I heard Dr. Pariar say, we have to know when to stop. Well, as limb lengthening surgeons, we have to make it clear to patients that we don't guarantee lengthening results. We don't guarantee a height. We guarantee a function. And the reason why they come to us is because we do not sacrifice function for numbers or speed for that matter. So this is the example of a, um, of a 49 year old male, 47 when he started, who was a uh, five foot seven, uh, wanted to do the femoral lengthening, had a realistic expectation of seven centimeters and reached his goal uh, beautifully. This gentleman has a YouTube channel where he describes this process. Um, came back a year and a half later with uh, external tibial torsion and says, well, if you correct my external tibial torsion, can you lengthen my tibias as well? And um, this is him after a couple uh, more inches in the tibias, an inch and a half. Those are his x-rays, um, beautiful regenerate throughout the lengthening. Uh, beautiful regenerate towards the end. Um, so this is this is an example on how having a successful, my apologies, having a, uh, a realistic expectation, a realistic goal can lead to a successful um, procedure. This is a young woman who was uh, four foot nine, um, was always, always felt like she was being treated like a child because she had effectively the height of a child. Uh, she walked into my office, scared. She walked into my office with a lack of confidence. And now when I see her, she bloomed into this beautiful young woman, confident. You know, she laughs, whereas before she never laughed, or I never saw her laugh. Now she laughs, she's happy. Um, 
a year and a half later, after an eight centimeter lengthening, um, she ran 10 kilometers. Uh, she ran a, a race um, and has normal function. I'm showing this video. It was taken six months after surgery and by no means do I wanna make anyone believe that this is the norm, okay? Six months after surgery, a lot of patients are still using crutches. They're still using a walker with the current technique of internal limb lengthening device. Uh, however, I'm showing this with, uh, with her consent. This is how she walks after six months with a, uh, a bone that is healed enough to, get, to allow this amount of weight bearing. A little unsteady on her feet still, but she's doing well. This is what we should expect as a function if not at six months, you know, more around the, the lines of nine to 10 months. Another gentleman who comes in with uh, a goal of five to six inches over the course of two to three surgeries. And he comes in, he's done his research. He knows that it's not possible over the course of one surgery. He says, I have three years, COVID, is, COVID just hit. I know that I, I can work remotely. And I want to do this. Goes from five foot one to five foot four, uh, or at least five foot two to five foot four after uh, a tibia lengthening, and then reaches five foot seven with another lengthening. Now he's five seven. His bones are fully healed. Extremely happy with his function. However, despite that, you can notice the gentleman on the left. He's still hunching. And when asked why do you hunch, he said. Well, I don't want people to notice too much my new height. You're, th you're looking at people who their whole life, they wanted to be taller, and yet they still feel stigmatized by the fact that society doesn't yet accept limb lengthening as a, as a procedure. He's clearly, when he doesn't hunch, he's clearly the tallest person on this picture. But still, he has this, this fear of being unmasked, extremely happy with his height. This is him two years after this quadrilateral lengthening. I'm showing this with his consent. Beautiful gait, walks completely normally and can, can run without a problem. This was the day before his hardware removal. And I could show examples over examples over examples on how realistic expectations yields good result. This is another young woman suffering from Tur Turner syndrome. So not purely sexual lengthening. She went from, uh, from four foot six uh, to five foot uh, two, I believe. Extremely happy with the result. Also, you have to let patients know in advance, we're still preoperatively here, that there is a world of potential complications. I often hear patients come into my office and say, I've met surgeons who made it seem like it would be easy to gain 15 centimeters of height with, with a quadrilateral lengthening, both femurs, both tibia at the same time. Well, the truth is it's not. It's hard work. It's the toughest procedure. It's the toughest thing that they'll most likely ever do physically. And they have to know that the potential complications of this procedure are life-threatening, function-threatening, and limb-threatening as well, if not handled properly. Now, during surgery, how do we stay out of trouble? Well, first, know the technique you're about to use, whether the technique is lengthening over a nail, a circular fixator, or circular hexapod, or all the different types of internal lengthening device. And for each method, careful, meticulous planning is key. You've got to know the pearls from each technique. you got to know which adjunct procedures to add and and how to modulate your surgery according to the technique that you're using. This is the example of a young, uh, young patient in his 20s who went to a, a very prominent practice in the, in the United States, obviously not Paley Center, uh, but a practice that advertises very heavily. And then three surgeries later, later with wrong entry points and attempts at fixing it, fixing it and improperly placed blocking screws, this is the result. The patient is devastated, right? He's looking for a solution. He, he's, he, the first thing they ask is, uh, he asked was, am I ever going to be normal again? 
This is a 30 year old male uh, who weighs 80 kilos. who went to once again, another uh, extremely rep well, quote unquote repeatable practice outside of the United States. And if you look carefully at that image, the nail that was used here is an 8.5 millimeter, which for all intensive purposes, is a pediatric nail. It's a nail that is contraindicated above 57 kilos of body weight. It's extremely unstable. And what had to happen happened after three centimeters of height, both nails failed in bending. This is a catastrophe. Another example of improper nail sizing, improper uh, entry point, improper position of a, um, of a syndesmotic screw and its effect on the ankle. Well, believe it or not, this patient has seen the money, num the money signs at the end of this procedure. And despite these horrific iatrogenic complications that could have been easily avoided with a little bit of skills and technique, has opened his own limb lengthening center with the surgeons that did this and is advertising heavily the services. Number two, perform the adjunct procedures that are necessary. And this is, this is a whole topic on its own. Not everyone agrees with which adjunct procedures need to be done or when they need to be done. But as a rule of thumb, some form of IT band fasciotomy has to be done for femoral lengthening, proper entry point as well. Tibial lengthening has to see syndesmotic fixation. We could discuss and debate for a long time about the need for gastrocnemius recession and, and should they be done preoperatively or postoperatively when, when, um, when uh, equinus contracture and positive selvage cold test appears. Nevertheless, it is a very useful adjunct procedure in this, in this treatment. Common perineal neurolysis, especially if there's been a previous lengthening above. Um, do we do it preoperatively or, or postoperatively? Down uh, there is the image of a patient who went to a, a practice in Germany that, quote unquote, does not believe in IT band tenotomies. And after five centimeters of height, he's walking as he's walking on the left, cannot fully extend his knees, cannot bring his legs together. Um, and only after a complete IT band release and a lot of physical therapy was he able to, um, to overcome these bad contractures. This is the example of, uh, of another patient who went to that same uh, practice, in Germany, practice in Germany where, where the uh, osteotomy uh, was performed with a saw rather than low velocity osteotomy technique. And what you can and see you can is see. that there is sclerosis at the edges of the bone. There's bone resorption at the, at, the, um, at the edges and there's a big cystic formation. There is no regenerate in there. So perform a low velocity osteotomy anytime you're doing distraction osteogenesis. My method of choice is the Dibassiani technique, multiple drill hole and osteotome. Um, beware fat embolism. Fat embolism is the, is the killer. Know how to recognize him and be in constant discussion with, with, the, um, with the anesthesiologist about the appearance of drop in blood pressure a drop in oxygen uh, saturation, and an increase in peak inspiratory uh, pressure. And the ways to avoid it is by being extremely deliberate and careful in drilling vent holes and doing a low-speed reaming and using uh, the best nail size for this patient. But when you know push comes to the shove, having ICU in, in your facility and the capacity to start or, or, or perform ECMO is the way to go. When using LON or for any reason, when bringing back a patient into the operating room, especially after lengthening, avoid forceful hip flexion and knee extension. The, uh, I, I get patients routinely who come from in some international practices. And after the second stage, they had sciatic, sciatic uh, nerve palsy. And I attribute it to the fact that assistance just forcefully bend the hip and, and extend the knee when doing the prep on a patient who is not awake or aware to mention that it hurts and they end up with traction injuries to the, uh, to the sciatic nerve. And when performing EMG, the EMGs uh, support that hypothesis. And finally, anyone can apply an external fixator or insert a nail. 
but that's really what, what the problem is. What makes the difference between a successful limb lengthening and a failed crippling limb lengthening is the decision-making. It's the post-operative period. It's, it's everything that goes afterwards. Identify and treat compartment syndrome, right? Promptly, maybe even avoid nerve blocks in patients who, uh, who are undergoing to be lengthening. And if doing a nerve block, an indwelling catheter that, catheter that can be titrated is a better idea than a complete block that leads to catastrophic complications. Don't lengthen too fast. Slow and steady wins the race. I've rarely, if ever, seen premature consolidation in a grown adult. Um, I think premature consolidation is the thing of, of pediatrics, where slow and steady creates better regenerate, allows sort of soft tissues to, to adapt, and, and allow for the physical therapist to catch up joint contractures. And that being said, proper experienced physical therapy is key. Physical therapy can kill or make a lengthening. Patients who, who go back to their home state um, are making a big mistake because they don't have the support system from an experienced limb lengthening set center to achieve their goal. So this is the example of someone who did a quadrilateral lengthening at, at an unchecked speed. Uh, some practices lengthen even at a, rate, a ridiculous rate of two millimeters per day. And this is the end result. Severe hip flexion contractures, knee flexion deformities, ankle, uh, sorry, knee flexion contractures, um, ankle equinus contractures, toe walking. This is a catastrophe. This will not yield a functional result. This patient uh, wrote on the forums, hey guys, anybody else develop drop put with tibia LON? Well, flash news, it is not normal to develop foot drop. And it should be addressed promptly. And when that patient reached out and I asked, well, did you get a common perineal nerve uh, neurolysis? Did, you, did your surgeon address the, length, the, the speed of lengthening? Did he shorten maybe your lengthening? The answer was no, no, and no. An example of a patient who lengthened too fast as well, and in, in which the bone regenerator was not um, addressed promptly enough and the speed of lengthening was not addressed promptly enough and ended up with atrophic bone edges and essentially a five centimeter bone defect. This is what he looks like after, after bone grafting and, um, and as a later on infusion. And for that reason, to avoid problems, these patients need to stay local. They need to have direct access to their limb lengthening center and have biweekly follow-ups. They need new x-rays every two weeks. They need a careful physical examination, know what to look for, okay? But also burnout is real. Limb lengthening burnout is, is something that exists. These patients after a few, a few weeks to a few months are, have had enough. They, 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 they need you to check on their psychological well-being. And that's why having a good social support, having people with them, having family that, um, that helps them can really be a great adjunct to their, uh, to their lengthening. And finally, address complications promptly. And ideally, you, you wouldn't want to have to address them after the fact. You want to be able to prevent them during those biweekly visits by modulating the length, the speed of lengthening. And most of the complications I talked about earlier can be addressed that simple way, by just slowing down, taking a break, shortening temporarily and lengthening again, increasing uh, your patient's nutritional intake, optimizing it, increasing their, their, um, their supplementation. There's multiple ways to skin a cat, okay? Another example of a patient who ended up with crippling deformities and who had to be treated by my partner, uh, Dr. Conway, to correct the deformities and the, um, and the bone defects. And finally, uh, curb the over-enthusiastic and over-zealous patient who's, who thinks, well, it doesn't hurt. Let me walk uh, unchecked. Okay, Each method and each implant has a different weight-bearing capacity, a circular external fixator, a hexapod, has more lengthening capacity than, a, than the current precise nail, but still curb uh, them because implant failures do occur, okay? So buyers beware. Um, 
the patient should be aware of all the potential complications. And I put this slide again because it's so important. Uh, this is not a walk in the park. This is potentially a, a crippling procedure if not done properly. And let's all remember the rules of ethical cosmetic limb lengthening. And the most important are that should be done in experienced hands with experienced facilities. And there should be some form of governing body that identifies problematic um, providers, surgeons, and disciplines them. It doesn't have to be you know, revoking a license. It can be forcing these surgeons to have proper training of the proper length, not just a weekend course, and, and, and review their cases and learn from their mistakes. So in conclusion, Cosmetic orthopedics is here to stay, whether it's height lengthening, knock knee correction, bow leg correction, whether we like it or not. So we have to start creating clear guidelines on how to perform them safely, just like other surgical specialties have done. And despite the fact that internal lengthening devices are, are sexy and are easy to, to use in surgery, distraction osteogenesis is still distraction osteogenesis and it has to be treated with humility properly. And finally, know all the potential pitfalls at every step and prevention is key. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoda, for this, uh, this invitation. And um, for those who um, have never come, have never been, uh, put this, uh, these dates in your calendar, August 21st to 25th, uh, 2024 will be the 34th Baltimore Limb Deformity Course and we look forward to seeing um, everyone in, in big numbers. On that, I would like to open the, um, to open the, um, the stage to the panel. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Michael, for the detailed, ex extensive presentation on all the aspects, the pre-op, the intra-op, and the post-op. Okay. I have one question, like uh, just a curiosity. Like in U.S., Roughly how many percentage of the surgeons are doing precise nail compared to lengthening over nail or the hexa board? Are majority, I, what I have a feeling like majority are with the precise nail. Well, what's the current I, uh, percentage? I think currently pretty much all the surgeons on the, on the market offer internal lengthenings with precise. And there's a few reasons, but there's, there's an assemble of complications and problems with external fixation lengthenings and lengthening over our nails that are simply not acceptable um, for cosmetic purposes, right? In terms of function. Remember, we take someone who's completely functional and we wanna make them the same, but taller. That's one reason. Reason number two is that the cost of healthcare in the United States doesn't necessarily make lengthening over a nail or external fixation lengthening that much cheaper. Um, and, and the regulations that mandate to use brand new implants every time and, and return to the operating room to remove the hardware and to, to lock the, uh, the nails. So there's not a big cost benefit and there's, there's risks for function that are not acceptable for American surgeons. I don't know if Dr. Pilly wants to add to that. No, I think you're right. <laughs> <clears throat> LON is not necessarily cheaper in the U.S. because you have to do a second surgery. And even though it's an outpatient surgery, it, that in itself has a significant uh, cost component. So when you add the two, you, there's not a lot of savings. Um, the other part of it is, you know, the truth is this should only be done with implantable because otherwise it's not a cosmetic procedure. But socioeconomics. Listen, if you had the availability we have of implantable nails, um, you probably, it would probably mostly be done that way. Um, the, the centers that are doing it still with XFIX, both in your country, in Turkey, some of the other countries, are, are mostly doing that to reduce costs or because of lack of availability. I mean, Nuvasiv doesn't sell this in every country. And currently they're really the only one on the market. There'll be a 
couple other nails coming out soon but you know uh, you you have also the fit bone which is also uh, just as expensive so not practical but from a point of view of a cosmetic procedure it's no argument this is it becomes a cosmetic procedure when it's invisible and the nail is as close to invisible as possible in fact you know, in 2018, uh, they came out with the stride nail, which was the f a full weight-bearing nail. And so then you did the surgery, and within a, less than a week, a patient was walking without walking aids, without crutches, without a walker. So patient could be walking around, and nobody would know that incisions are minimally invasive. They're tiny incisions. If you do this properly, the nail lengthening requires, actually the biggest incision for the femur is the IT band release. All the rest are look like mosquito bites, okay? And, um, you know, so it's, it's a, uh, it, it is fairly invisible operation. Um, stride nail went off the market in 2021 due to corrosion because it was a stainless steel implant and there were some corrosion issues. Um, December or January this year, we're waiting for a new nail that I've helped them develop. I developed the stride nail originally, and I've helped them develop this new nail, which is the uh, called the Max nail. And the Max nail is made of titanium, so it won't have corrosion issues. We hope it won't have any other issues, but you know, the stride nail had no other issues. It was only the corrosion. Did incredibly well as a limb lengthening nail, incredibly well. And it proved the point that patients could pretty much walk around almost normally with very little limp during that. Probably, if you think about it, if you're not on crutches, you never get weak. You, you, you know, you never, your, your anti-gravity muscles, which are your glutei, your quadriceps, and your gastrosoleus, those are your anti-gravity muscles. They never get weak if you're not on crutches all the time. If you're on crutches all the time, of course, they will atrophy a bit. These patients are really not getting that weak, so they don't get much limp during the lengthening. And so they lead fairly normal lives during the lengthening. That's when it's beginning to be on par with our concept of a cosmetic procedure. And it's the concept. Think about it. Can you imagine that... If someone wanted to have a breast augmentation, they would be put in a wheelchair or on crutches or a walker for three months. <laughs> Unimaginable. What woman would go and have that done if the, just to have a breast augmentation? Okay. And can you imagine, you know, if, uh, if they were going to have to be 12 weeks at some center away from home? So, we're never going to be like any other cosmetic procedure because the risks of this procedure are much higher and the, the interruption of normal life is much higher than almost any other cosmetic procedure. You know, by the way, we're also doing this as an inpatient procedure. Most, most other cosmetic procedures are done as an outpatient. I don't know if this is a thing in, in India, but in, in the US, everything's going to ambulatory surgery centers away from inpatient hospitals. What prevents us from doing that right now is not so much the pain factor, but the danger of fat emboli. I mean, as, as Michael correctly pointed out, although the, the incidence is small, there's about a 4% incidence of fat embolism symptomatic fat embolism what's what is symptomatic fat embolism a drop of of um pulse oximeter measurement that cannot be explained by any other cause not pneumonia not not a pulmonary embolus from, from a dvt or something and it occurs sometimes as early as the recovery room okay um talk about knowing how to deal with this if you don't know how to deal with this, especially with nail lengthening, 
then you're going to lose some patience. Okay. And, um, you know, that's why Michael mentioned the availability of an ICU or even ECMO. I haven't had in my career one patient end up on ECMO. Okay. He survived. I've not lost a patient yet, but I've had two patients end up in the ICU. Uh, we have a 4% incidence of fat emboli. We've dropped it recently. It'll be interesting to study it because we have a paper on the original incidence. We've measured, um, I'm sorry, we've, we've changed our protocol. So you got to use reamers that are especially sharp and especially deep. So they actually don't generate as much fat embolism. You need to ream slowly. You need to create venting uh, in the femur easy to do with multiple drill holes at the planned level of osteotomy. In the tibia, if you do that, you'll get a compartment syndrome. So we don't do that. Okay. And um, so the um, giving albumin ahead of time reduces uh, fat emboli. Um, being on alert for it in surgery, where you look for increased uh, ventilation pressure where you look for drop in pulse ox and drop in blood pressure. Those are your three indicators. And our anesthesiologists are watching this the whole time. And if they see anything, they notify us. So we slow down, we stop maybe for a while, um, consider not doing the second side and coming back another day. You know, all these things are really important if you've just taken a course and had to stick a nail in, you're not going to know any of this. Okay. This is really important. This is part of what I was saying before, knowing how to prevent as well as treat the complications and how do you treat it afterwards? By the way, I mean, we've identified that the highest risk group are vapors, vapors, both patients who ended up in the ICU, the only commonality of them, they're both young, by the way, but there were vapors. And we think vaping causes predisposing lung damage that's even worse than smoking. Okay, so it's an, a new modern disease that we're facing. So yeah, I, that's kind of my comments. Um, so Dr. Uh, Billy, okay. interest, yeah. interestingly, I used to, um, upon the recommendation of your, your previous partner, I used to not do vent holes in the tibias as well. And then what I realized is that you can only drill the anterior cortex of the tibia yeah. and maybe a very distal hole medially during the whole reaming part to get essentially that vent and right before the osteotomy finish the posterior and lateral cortex. Of course, so I, I've done that um, only drilling the anterior cortex. Haven't been impressed by the amount of vents, but it's created a another problem is that you get, and you have to, you, you get some of this bone sitting under the skin and um, you gotta make sure you correct it out because otherwise I've ended up with a little HO there. I don't think you get as much fat embolism from doing the tibias. So um, don't know why, but you don't seem to. Um, so I've stopped doing the anterior drill hole. I did, I did that for a little while. And um, uh, the one thing we don't do, I have done, but we don't do, is I don't do four nails at once. My limit is two. I have done two patients where we did four nails at once. And uh, one of them, nothing happened at all. And uh, one of them did get fat and blood. So not severe, but, you know, so I, you know what, my coronary arteries can't take it. Um, I, I do two nails. Um, and, and interestingly, in the past year, because we watch our numbers, our incidence of fat emboli have dropped to about 1% when it was consistently 4% for many years. And I don't know why that is. Okay, uh, Dr. Belly, I have a question. Like in India, we don't have precise nails yet. So will you be recommending doing limb lengthening on hexapods or uh, LRS or the classical Elizaro? As you said that 
it's a cosmetic thing to it should be only done by the implantable nails so what's no, your recommendation? Look, i i can't i can't be a i can't say that i didn't mean to say i said ideally i said ideally look before we had fully implantable nails okay so before the year 2000 well I started in the 1990s with the Albizia nail. We had a few of them, but most of the 90s, we did LON. In fact, originally before I developed LON, because I did my first LON in 1990, okay? And my first cosmetic case was 1988. I did purely fixators and I only did um, tibias. And then we went to LON. And LON, I don't, you know, I don't, is Mungo still on? Um, I, I um, don't agree with you, Mongol, about femur LON. I've done so many femur LON, and you can get the nail. You know, if you look at my original article in JBJS 1997, shows you how to put the fixator on and avoid touching the nail, because you should not have a communication to avoid infection. Um, and... I think you can do it very safely and you end up with enough nail in the distal part of the femur to stabilize it. So I don't think that's a problem. LON for the femur is a good technique. And in fact, there's many advantages of lengthening the femur versus lengthening the tibia. You know, you lengthening a tibia, you're more limited. Uh, you can lengthen up to about five centimeters max if you start going beyond that you really start getting into equinus contractures quinus quinovarus um, so we rarely lengthen the tibia more than five centimeters with the circular fixator you can kind of do that because you can hold the foot but i, I don't like to do that i like to you know, i like to exercise the foot and i don't like to immobilize it because i think you do get some stiffness so I think you can do it with, with circular fixators below the knee, monolateral fixators above the knee, both over nails. Why over nails? To reduce the X fix time. And you significantly reduce the X fix time. You significantly reduce any, uh, what do you call it? Um, axial deviation. Uh, Rob Rosbrook prefers um, lengthening and then nailing which is a variation on the theme um, where you're using a circular fixator on the tibia, lengthening, placing your pins out of the path of the planned nailing and then coming in and nailing. I personally prefer a lengthening over nail. It's dealer's choice on that. Um, and, but either of those achieves the exact same thing, which is the ability to remove the external fixator at the end of the distraction phase. And so it removes that problem of waiting forever for the consolidation phase. It removes the consideration of fracture or bending or so on. And it reduces axial deviation as well. So I think that under your circumstances, if you cannot get um, implant fully implantable nails, it is completely reasonable to do it with LOM. Look, it's reasonable to do it with X fix. It's just going to be much harder on the patient. Okay, sir. Thank you. And uh, Siddharth, so there, there are some questions in the chat. So, will you uh, like to discuss these questions with the panel? Yes, sir. I think uh, because we have very experienced people sitting on the panel. So, it's good. So, uh, some of the answers have already been uh, given. But there is this recent question by Dr. Arvind, like what are the chances of infection in lengthening over nail and how do you manage it? Well, the question is addressed to Dr. Mangal Parihar, sir, if he's here. I think he's he he yeah, he busy uh, the conference. He must be busy, but uh, the same question to Dr. Spaley and Dr. Asiag. Like, how do you manage infection, if at all, if you do have infection with lengthening over nail, how do you manage it? So you, um, I've, I've published on both subjects, the LON technique 
uh, and, and we reported, I forget, I think maybe a 4% incidence of infection. And we reported how to prevent that, like including locking from the medial side instead of the lateral side to stay away from the fixator and its pins. So there are ways to reduce that risk. Um, the, um, but if you happen to get an intramedullary infection, it is actually not a hard infection to treat. It is localized to the medullary canal. And um, what you do is you, so if it develops while you're still lengthening, then what you should do is um, if there's an abscess, you got to drain it. And if you, you can continue lengthening, but you need to suppress the infection. You suppress the infection with IV antibiotics. By the way, it's the same thing if you have it with an implantable nail. Suppress, drain it if there is something to drain. If there's nothing to drain, just suppress it. And then wait until you can take the nail out. So you stay on suppressive antibiotics basically until the bone is consolidated or until you can take the nail out. Um, so what allows you to take the nail out? Either full consolidation of the bone or being willing to exchange nail um, with an antibiotic coated nail. Now there are two different types of solutions for both those situations. If the bone is fully consolidated, but you have an infected medullary canal, you take out the implant, you ream the bone, you wash out the canal, and then you fill it with um, an antibiotic impregnated, I'm sorry, antibiotic impregnated cement, either absorbable or non-absorbable into that space with minimal or maximal metal. Let me explain. If the bone is healed, doesn't need much protection. We published a paper in 2001 using a beaded guide rod and uh, regular cement impregnated with antibiotics, okay? Since then, it's easier and you don't have to take out the, because that's still an implant. Um, and cement eventually is a porous implant that can actually harbor bacteria after it elutes it. So to avoid removing that, we now use absorbable cement. What's absorbable cement? Absorbable cement is calcium sulfate, which is basically plaster of Paris. Now, don't just go take your plaster of Paris and do this. It is a sterile uh, plaster of Paris. And it is, uh, I mean, in our country, it comes under the label of a product called Stimulan. But I think there are many of these uh, calcium sulfate products out there. It basically uh, absorbs in six to 12 weeks, okay? And you can inject it as a liquid and I used one of these long tubes that you inject down the canal like a cement with a cement gun. I inject it from the bottom up. And then I put, you would put a rush rod. We have a similar device called the slim rod that we put inside just to protect the bone. That's in a healed bone. In a bone that let's say you still have to wait for the regenerate to heal, but you don't want to wait and be on IV antibiotics for so many more months then we would take out, we would, I'm sorry. If we have no fixator on because it's an implantable nail, we would put a temporary X fix anteriorly, okay? Just need two pins, one proximal, one distal and a bar. Take out the existing nail, ream out the canal, do exactly what I just said, except now we would put a regular lock nail with stimulant. We used to, prepare PMMA impregnated cement, coat the nail inside of a silicone tube. You can buy silicone tubing at the hardware store, sterilize it. We used to use chest tubes, but they melt when this PMMA heats up. So it's better to use silicone tubing of the diameter you want, put your locked IM nail in that, let it harden. But I don't, that takes time to do. I don't even bother with that. I just inject stimulan 
and shove my nail down. Stimuli is liquid and I shove my nail down. That saves me about half an hour, okay, of all the preparation. And it is easy, it's quick and it's effective. Um, and that's what we do if we want to, so we'll exchange nail that, lock the nail, take the fixator off. Okay, that's if we have a regenerate that's going to collapse. Okay, and um, um, there's one more category that you should ask about, and I'll just volunteer it. And that is, what if you have a patient who's had a previous external fixator on, and you're going to put a nail in? So there is a certain incidence of provoking an intermedullary infection. And what we found is it's 17%. It's an unacceptable number, 17%. So then what we start, so the reason that this happens is you have all these latent forms inside the bone since the X fix went on. When you go in with your reamer, you devascularize the canal and you create a very good environment where your own blood cells can't come and attack and prevent an infection. So the bacteria might get reawakened and flourish there. So what we do now, if they've had a previous X fix, but not really any history of osteomyelitis or anything, we will give them two weeks of antibiotics after surgery. So you get oral antibiotics, for two weeks after discharge from hospital. In hospital, they'll get IV vancomycin for three days, and then they get discharged on oral, okay? Like clindamycin or, or Bactrim or something like that. There's something that covers, um, you know, covers uh, uh, MRSA. The, there's a, another subgroup, and that, by the way, since we did that, we've reduced our recurrent infection down to 1%, it's from 17% down to 1%. There's another group where um, you have a history, not just of an X fix, but they had a bone infection at some point. They, they, it was worse, you know, they had big holes, that you know, you're worried. In those patients, when I put a nail in, ream the canal, I inject stimulin from day one, and we put the lengthening nail in or the lengthening over nail in, whichever one it is, because that's a high risk patient. The stimulant does not seem to get in the way of making regenerate, okay? It's osteoconductive, so probably not a problem for the lengthening. Um, I, I think in Baltimore, you use similar protocols, don't you, Michael? That's correct, that's correct. Actually, I still use the PMMA impregnated uh, coated nails, except when doing a precise nail with a previous external fixator, in which case we found that it doesn't hinder the mechanism by just injecting the uh, calcium sulfate, um, inserting the nail, and the nail just lengthens properly and, and as intended. So that's really my protocol. Yeah, we've, you know, for the, well, first of all, you can't put, <laughs> PMMA on the precise nail. Exactly. Uh, not going to work very well. Um, but, you know, the, for the, and that's prophylactic. That's not therapeutic because if you're doing therapeutic, you're on a solid nail. Um, Correct. You know, we've just stopped making these. Look, my publication was the first one out there on putting a PMMA nail inside the bone, um, first with a thin implant, Janet Conway then, you know, uh, published on that with a lock nail. And, um, and, and that works very well, it takes more time, you have to prepare these, you know, it's a little more complicated. The stimulan is so easy and quick, you mix this stuff and you inject it right away and you stick your nail in. So you don't have to bother with the molding of, uh, you know, molding of the cement and cutting off the silicone tube or, or chest tube or whatever you're using. 
You don't have to worry about any of that. And sometimes, and you don't have to worry about removing it. And let me tell you, sometimes they're not so easy to remove, okay? Or some of the cement stays behind on the, on, uh, after you pull it out, it breaks off, it flakes off. So with the stimulant, we don't have any of that issue anymore. And it's just as effective. And it carries, remember, it's only important for, for six weeks. You don't need this for more than six weeks. So, and the stimulant lasts for six weeks. It, it's done eluding after six weeks. In fact, the antibiotics are more readily eludable from calcium sulfate than they are from PMMA. So another reason to consider, and it's osteoconductive. So if there's any bone healing going on, it probably can, it doesn't hurt it. If anything, it helps it. One of the caveat that I would add is that I've seen uh, catastrophes in people who didn't have all their ducks in a row when the stimulant was injected, whereas the stimulant hardened before the nail was in, which yielded obviously the, the catastrophe that you can think of with bone fractures, uh, false trajectory, and so forth. So just know for the, 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 pan, the um, participants that if you are going to undertake this treatment, make sure that the nail is nice and ready to be inserted before injecting the, PM, the uh, calcium sulfate. Yeah, and make sure you inject it like immediately when it's at the second it's mixed and liquid enough, inject it from bottom to top. Don't worry about coming out the holes. You can clean those out after and then put your, put your nail in, whatever type of nail in. Don't worry about the locking. Locking, you can drill through the, the stuff, but right. uh, even the PMMA, you can drill through that stuff. But just get the nail down that canal. So, Dr. Paley, a quick follow-up question on Stimulan. So, we do get Stimulan in India, and I'm pretty sure all of my colleagues here have used it. What's the typical amount of uh, the, the amount that you use? Because we get it as 5 cc and 10 cc. So, how much Stimulan would you typically put in the tibia? So, not just tibia, femur, or whatever. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I know the answer. Maybe Michael does, but I, I, I you know, we mix it and then we, if you're putting a nail on top of that, okay. So it depends. Sometimes it's just the stimulant going in maybe with a rush rod. If you're putting a nail on top of it, the nail takes up a lot of volume. And, um, but I like to fill the canal and then have it all squirt out. That's my approach. Now you could do a simple calculation, 30 centimeter medullary canal with let's say um, to make the math easy a 10 millimeter uh diameter was reamed okay so 30 times 10 is 300 c is uh, what is that 30 centimeter yeah 300 cc's okay so you need five cc's is not enough okay so you need a lot of this stuff this stuff come on it's got to be cheap even in india this is plaster of paris okay they're charging you a lot and go make it yourself. It's not hard to make and sterilize it. Um, I have one question uh, with the panel. Like in India, uh, uh, majority of the cases, we do lengthening in cases of bone defects, especially in cases of infected non-union where we did a proper debridement and we uh, wait for the wound to heal and when, then we do an osteotomy to lengthen for the defect. Like in, um, there are some people who say that even if the wound is red and there's not much infection, you can go for the osteotomy because osteotomy will uh, help in uh, minimizing the infection. And some say is that you should wait for the wound to completely to heal, how much time it may take. So what's your take? Like we should wait for the wound completely to heal to go for an osteotomy or we can go a little early also when there is no visible sign of infection in the wound. Yeah, I don't, I don't really care if there's a wound or not wound. I mean, a percutaneous osteotomy, if you if you properly, if you debrided the bone right there, so it's a, it's a wide open, big hole in the bone that was previously infected, I, I have no reservations about, um, you know, these are usually fixator cases about doing a percutaneous corticotomy of the tibia, let's say. In the proximal tibia and having a distal big open wound that I just debrided 
Um, what I do is two setups. I'll do the dirty part of the procedure first and, and not even allow my, you know, whatever hardware um, I'm going to put in to be opened yet. And then we'll reprep, redrape, and new equipment, not use the same forceps and scissors and, and drills and everything. So it's a, it's a clean procedure as far as I'm concerned at that point. I mean, we routinely will perform soft tissue transport along with bone transport after doing a, a corticotomy uh, for, for soft tissue defects that, that are accompany bone defects. So as, you, as Dr. Pelli just mentioned, this is not part of the equation. The equation is what is the treatment necessary to solve this problem? And that's it. So that is there any other question? So yes, sir. In fact, I can see one more question from Dr. Sunil. If you are doing a femur lengthening uh, with a lengthening over nail procedure, do you still need an iliotibial band release in all of your cases? It's got nothing to do with the lengthening over nail. Yeah, exactly. Even in fact, with lengthening over nail, you definitely need it. But you need it in all. If you're doing in all your stature lengthenings. I do a distal IT band release in 100% of them, okay? Um, in a certain percentage, I also, not instead of, I also do a proximal. So now the question is, why? what's my indication for the proximal? The proximal ones are being done. If I cannot adduct the leg, cross the leg over the other leg, you know, when you do it, I do my nailing supine, and I cross one leg over the other, okay? Uh, and I get my starting point in the piriformis fossa. In order to do that, I need to cross the leg. Some people's proximal fascia lata is so tight, you can't do that. That is an, first of all, it makes it difficult to do the surgery. Secondly, it's an indication they're going to end up with with that kind of wide base gait, they're going to be stuck there, even with the distal lengthening. So I start by releasing distally. And that is a transection. It's a three centimeter incision <coughs> on the lateral side of the uh, leg at the level of the superior pole of the patella. Okay. You go down, you actually go on the back of the, where the intermuscular septum is. And I go in. I cut the iliotibial band in the front. I actually cut the intermuscular septum. Just be careful. You got the uh, lateral geniculate artery that bleeds if you get it. You know, it's not nice. Um, and then I actually go back to the biceps muscle at that level, and I do a fractional lengthening. Just cut the aponeurosis there. Um, you're there. It's free. Um, and so... After that, I test it. And if it's still tied to adduction, I'll make at the level of the greater trochanter, I make a three centimeter incision. And then you cut with your knife. It's basically a blind cut. You cut on the iliotibial band until you get to the GT, okay, greater trochanter. And then you take a blunt scissors. And you put one, one part on one side of the uh, fascia lata, one on the other, and you run it up and you run it down. It is so thick, especially when you run it posteriorly, you hear it break. And, and then, then you can adduct the leg and they don't get a problem. If, by the way, they come in like, like Michael showed that, you know, after rehab a year later, they're still walking like that. That's the solution. That little operation I just told you makes it go away. It has very little downside. Neither of these create a muscle hernia, by the way. If you cut the IT band anywhere in the middle between those two incisions, you'll get a muscle hernia. But there's no muscle at those two locations. So. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Rajat, I think we are almost at the end of... Uh, this masterclass. It's three minutes. I think, Siddharth, we, we had a case discussion. Will you like to present that? 
so i think we have run out of time sir okay okay we have uh, the master class from 8 to 10 but if there is any question from any of the panelists one thing one thing i will uh, just one thing sir i would like to request dr peli like when we have young surgeons coming out most of them actually ask for since there are not much books on techniques of basic techniques of elizaro or deformity correction so they ask for all the articles and since dr peli has written extensively from a to z i think on every point which is there any every topic is there so is there any way we, where can we can get um, main all your main articles and give it to the youngsters because they don't have the money at still that stage to buy every article so yeah, it would be a uh, great gift to all these surgeons i can uh, email you we have a google drive with all my articles up on the google drive they're they're welcome to download them as much as they want. Um, so um, I'll, I'll just send me an email, remind me you want the Google Drive and I'll, I'll make that accessible. Okay, that will be great. I think that will be the best gift for all the young surgeons out there, sir. Thank you very much for that. And uh, in future, they have a lot of articles from Baltimore. So, you know, I'm, I don't know if you guys do a similar thing, uh, Michael, but, um, you know, Dr. Herzenberg and Dr standard and you know uh, many of my articles were from baltimore and you know and then dr conway and dr asayag now and dr bibbo and uh and now dr mcclure i don't know if i left anyone out <laughs> at your place no i think you got it all um you know so they're they're also a very experienced group who have a lot of uh and and you know they've published a lot so um i'm sure if Michael has some other way to make them easily available, that would be useful to your young surgeons too. Thank we you, have sir. them all gathered on uh, Zotero, but I'll see um, uh, Rajat if we can uh, put them in a Google Drive or OneDrive and send them okay. to your way. Okay, thank you, Michael. I think it will be a great gift to all the young surgeons out there. And uh, uh, I take this platform to invite uh, Sir Dr. Pele, Sir and Michael. We like we have the Assamicon in 2024 in April in the our much loving Goa. I think, Sir, you must have been there like five six times, minimum. In India, because or from in my yeah, because been, from my I've been to India twenty times, and I've been to Goa, you know, several. You don't know this, but my last trip to India, I contracted uh, COVID um yeah in delhi sir yeah yeah and uh i may have been your first case of go of of covid well i, I guess not the first because i got it from someone else but um maybe the first documented case i went I, I ended up hospitalized with pneumonia in in uh abu dhabi after the conference <laughs> so okay that was uh, my last my last in-person trip to india so, but I, I love India and I've been there 20 times and I hope to be there more times. So, okay. So, one thing I will say, we are all, I, I'm always fascinated by the, your facts. Like, whatever we ask you, you exactly know the numbers. I have been done this this much of times, I've been come here this much of time. You are so clear on every data, on every topic. And that's fascinating also. And that's, one thing more, I always getting heard. Older. <laughs> yeah. I said, that's called getting older. And uh, that's why that, you know, that I never understood that, um, you know, that expression, sage advice. You know, I, I think it's just, it's a nice way to say you're old. <laughs> so I've been doing this thir 36 or 37 years. And uh, um, I hope that, uh, you know, no one gets to do this forever, but I hope I get to do it for a little bit longer. and. Um, share some of this wisdom with this next generations. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, I, again, uh, I'm thankful from, uh, on behalf of Assam India to Dr. Michael and Dr. Pele and Dr. Mangal and Siddharth to make this uh, uh, webinar a wonderful one. Dr. Mangal is here. So any closing comment, Dr. Mangal, uh, sir, uh, on the topic? No, I think uh, Michael and Dr. Bailey covered up or uh, reinforced many of the messages, I think, which I wanted to give. I think that's important. 
that's it okay now the last and not the least we have dr choudhury also in the panel i think this is a wonderful panel today so maybe some uh, some few inputs from dr choudhury also about the cosmetic limb lengthening to have a complete discussion um well very kind of you to invite me i think very little remains to be said after hearing a uh, drawer and um I'm not tremendously fond of this. I do very okay with this surgery. I perform very few of these. With the hexapodes, the TSF, not having access to the precise, I carefully select my patients for the lesser amount of headache they're going to give me. And uh, all the things that Dror and Michael have said are germane, and Mangal has said are very germane. I'm very um, circumspect. I'm very careful about deciding them, but really I have nothing more to add. Everything has been said before. And the cautionary note to everyone, to the younger ones who are venturing into this should remain uppermost in their minds. Thank you very much for this lovely webinar. Thank you, George. Milan, lovely to see you. I didn't realize you were there. Great. Lurking as usual. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thanks again for coming. And so I will be sending an email uh, to Dr. Pele and Dr. Michael for the articles. And it, I think it will be a great help to our young servants. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again from Assam, India. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. A wonderful seminar.